Kia ora koutou everyone. My name is Nikki Roy and I'm one of the support services coordinators at Leukemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand. Uh, welcome to our afternoon session with Dr. Sean McPherson, where we'll be discussing understanding blood results. Just prior to me introducing Sean, just want to let you know that you do have the opportunity to send in your questions. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please send those questions in. And if we have time at the end of our session, then I'll read those uh, out to Sean. Uh, so to introduce Dr. Sean McPherson as a haematologist and senior clinical lecturer employed jointly by the University of Otago Christchurch and by Canterbury District Health Board. He is part of the University of Otago Christchurch Haematology Research Group, currently investigating immunosuppression and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Cross-campus laboratory collaborations involve research into acute myeloid leukemia, myodysplastic syndromes, and hemiostasis. Sean is an enthusiastic teacher and uses a number of innovative techniques, including song, poetry, and drama to get his message across. So welcome, Sean. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, right, now, how do I share my screen? Here we go. Uh, that. And... Right. Um, kia ora. Um, yeah, my name is Sean McPherson. I'm a Scottish haematologist in Christchurch. Um, I've been here since 2013. I love it. And um, thank you to uh, Leukemia and Blood Cancer. New Zealand for inviting me to uh, to speak about blood results. Okay, so yeah, blood results. I mean, they they often form the focus of, or they usually form the focus of uh, clinic appointments. It's usually, what we're talking about when we see you in clinic. So um, they're important. So we'll talk about the importance of blood results. We use them to make the initial diagnosis quite often, almost always, in fact. And we use blood results to monitor disease progress response to treatment, and make some management decisions. Now, there'll be, I'm hopeful that there are a few different um, groups of patients out there watching, and some will be very interested in things like, uh, say, the paraprotein if you've got myeloma, or maybe the LDH if you've got lymphoma. But what everyone, I expect, is, uh, is used to dealing with is the complete blood count, or CBC. Uh, you'll have to forgive me if I lapse into UK speak and call it the full blood count every so often. Um, I am partially assimilated into New Zealand culture, and although I call it the full blood count, I spell it CBC. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll get it right one day eventually. But we'll talk about the basics of the CBC, and we'll talk about some if, if some of the parameters are abnormal, what, what does that actually mean? What does it represent? And I'll give you some real examples. Um, I will eventually get to some other blood tests, and uh, if there's some time at the end, I might sing you a song. I somehow managed to crowbar three songs into this last time, but to be honest, if you wanted to see me singing songs, you could, you could watch me on YouTube, and I think, I presume you want to know about blood tests, so I'll stick with that until we get mm, further on. So, um, I went to university in Glasgow. This is this is Glasgow, not Dunedin, but they look identical. And they uh, impressed upon us there the importance of the patient's history and examination findings. So the, these trump everything. These are the most important thing. Um, and blood, blood tests, you can, you can pretty much forget about those. But actually, if you're a haematologist, you clearly can't. Haematology is not like that. Uh, if I don't have your blood results, I'm pretty much paralyzed. I can't make any treatment decisions. So sticking with the, uh, the CBC, we, we take blood from you, and the CBC is the blood test that goes in the purple top tube. Uh, and the purple top tube's got a chemical in it called EDTA. I can't for the life of me remember what that stands for, but it prevents the blood from clotting. And it means that when we take the blood, we can put it in one of these blood analyzers, CBC analyzers, and um, it, you can actually use that to analyze it. But I should have got a, a photograph of, um, of our own laboratory um, machine there, but I, I didn't. I, this is one that I found on eBay, 
which uh, you can you can own for the uh, very reasonable sum of two and a half US dollars, two and a half thousand US dollars. Now, the inside of the machine, the outside of the machines, um, ooh, hang on. outside of the machine is rather bland looking because uh, it's got this protective casing and it's got these trays so that we can put racks, whole racks of blood tubes in there and we can do lots and lots at the same time. Um, inside the, the machine, uh, you've got your racks of blood tubes and there's various moving parts and tubes and sharp things like this needle here, which sticks into the top of the blood tube, sucks out uh, the blood, and then through some marvelous feats of engineering, the, the, the blood cells actually end up filing through a, a, a chamber in single file. And what we used to have, the old CBC analyzers, was we just pass an electric current across that chamber. And when a, a blood cell went through there, then the, the resistance would change, the analyzer would recognize that, and the different types of cells would have different characteristic patterns. So we, we do uh, use that, but we also use slightly more um, modern technology. We use a laser. And if we shine this laser through and it strikes one of these cells, then the light will be scattered. And the pattern uh, in which the light is scattered is characteristic for each different cell group. So this, uh, what is this? I can't really tell what that is. But uh, say it's a, a neutrophil, then it will have a different scatter pattern to a lymphocyte or a monocyte. So we can use a combination of these things uh, to build up a, a dot plot. And each of the dots on this plot, this is what the machine generates, each dot represents a single cell. And you can see that all the lymphocytes tend to land in roughly the same uh, part of the graph. Monocytes sit about here, neutrophils sit here, eosinophils. So the, the, the machine can distinguish between the different types of cells. Unfortunately for me and you, uh, we, don't, we don't leave it at that. The machine takes that information and it spits out a report and we get all these results in columns here. So we get a hemoglobin level. So that represents the number of red cells that you've got and the, and the, and the oxygen carrying pigment, pigment within them. We've got reference ranges. So uh, females, uh, the hemoglobin would be between 115 and 155. The reference range is a little bit higher in males, and that's because testosterone drives production of red cells. So you have a slightly higher hemoglobin level. We get these other results all generated from the machine. So we, we know things like the white cell count, the neutrophils, and the number of platelets. They've all got these reference ranges. Now, the reference ranges follow a normal distribution pattern, so a sort of bell-shaped curve. And let's say this represented the hemoglobin uh, in, a fem in, a, in a female population. You find that most of, most of the results, if you took 100 uh, patients and you, and you uh, took their blood and checked the hemoglobin level, most of the results would fall in this, uh, around about here, say about 135, 140 grams per litre. And then there would be completely normal results that fell either side of that. And then by definition, there'd be about 5% of normal results actually fall just outside the reference range. So that's worth remembering when you get your blood results back. If they're just slightly out with the reference range, they come up in red and they look, they look quite dramatic, but um, often they're really nothing to worry about. Um, now, that isn't uh, a hemoglobin level. That actually represents the distribution of marks for the fifth year's um, hematology exam a couple of years ago. So that followed a normal distribution as well. So what sort of abnorm abnormalities can we see um, in the CBC? Well, basically, it might be that you've got too many of one kind of cell, or you might not have enough of that kind of cell, or the cells might look a bit strange, and we can have various combinations. Hemoglobin is the, um, that's the measurement that we use to, it's a surrogate marker really for the number of red cells. And we use it because it's the oxygen carrying molecule within the red cell. If your hemoglobin level is low, you can't carry as much oxygen as you need to the, uh, the vital organs and you might get a bit breathless and tired. And these are the symptoms that we see when people are anemic. So if your hemoglobin level is low, you're anemic 
and uh, and we will, we will we will see that um, from we'll get that result from the CBC analyzers. Hemoglobin represents your red cells. There are three basic causes of anemia. At least that's what I tell the students. I say if you look up causes of anemia, you'll see an enormous list of things. But you can break it down to three. Uh, simple causes. You could either be losing red cells, and that's also known as bleeding. Um, it might be that your red cells are being destroyed in the circulation, and that's known as hemolysis. There might be some patients watching this just now that have either have or have had autoimmune hemolysis or other kinds of hemolytic anemia. Uh, or it might be that you're just not making enough red cells. And that's probably what we see most often in our hematology patients. The bone marrow can't function properly because of things like leukemia or myelodysplasia, then the red cell production is lower than it should be and your hemoglobin level is low. And that's, that causes anemia. You can have combinations of all of the above. And I do have a song about that, but I'm gonna save it for later because I've hardly told you anything yet. Um, if there's an appetite for a song later, I'll, I'll play it for you on the ukulele. So, hemoglobin is too low, that's anemia. How do we determine the cause? Well, one thing we can do is we can look at the, uh, the blood under the microscope. We can ask for a blood film. Now, this is a normal blood film. See the, the, the round pink things are your red cells, and they've got a nice area a pale area in the middle, and that's because they're shaped, shaped a bit like a frisbee. They're thin in the middle and a bit thicker around the edges. So like one of those soft frisbees that you can, you can buy and chuck around. Um, so that's a normal number and a normal appearance of red cells, and these are a normal size. This cell in the middle is a neutrophil, and that just gives you, uh, gives you a, a reference for how, 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 large or, how large red cells ought to be in comparison to a neutrophil. And these little smudgy things here, these little smudges are platelets. And that's about the right number of red cells to platelets to neutrophils. That's what we'd expect to see in a normal blood film. Contrast with this, where the red cells are all a funny shape. That's an awful lot of elongated red cells. We call these pencil cells. And there's some where it looks like the red cells a bit like a target, and they're quite pale in the middle as well, because there's less hemoglobin in these cells. This is the picture that we typically see in iron deficiency anemia. So it looks completely different from normal. This image shows uh, a picture that we'd see in um, hemolytic anemia. These red cells don't have that pale area in the middle. They've actually turned into spherical things that are called spherocytes. And that's typically what we would see in autoimmune hemolysis. You can see there's much, much larger spaces in between the red cells as well, so much, much fewer red cells in total. So this is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And this uh, image shows myelodysplasia. The red cells are all different shapes and sizes. There's some that look like they're a bit fragmented. Um, some of them are a bit paler than others, but they all look, they all look a bit strange. And this cell in the middle, it's, it should actually look like this. It's supposed to be a neutrophil. It looks completely different. There are hardly any granules in the cytoplasm. So this is quite a granular thing. This looks totally different. And instead of having these lobes of the nu nucleus, these three or more lobes in the nucleus, there's only two and they look a bit like a dumbbell. So this is a very odd shaped um, neutrophil, and this is, this is called a pelgarized neutrophil. We typically see these in myelodysplasia. So, so uh, this is an example of how we can make these different diagnoses just by looking at the blood film. This is normal, this is iron deficiency anemia, this is myelodysplasia, and this is hemolytic anemia. Now, I promised some examples. So these are real, these are real examples. Um, this is so, and it's a typical story. Say you've got a 68-year-old man who feels fine apart from his arthritic knee. So he goes and he sees the surgeon, and the surgeon says, Oh, yeah, we, we, we could we could fix that for you, we could replace that. 
but we'll, we better do some blood tests and send you to see the anaesthetist. So I do the blood tests and I get the surprise because although he felt fine, hemoglobin is low, 105, so that's the reference range there. So he's anemic. The white cells are a bit low, should be between 4 and 11, and they're down at 2.9. Neutrophils, which you need to fight off infection, 0.8, that's, you'll know that's quite low, 1.9 to 7.5 is the reference range for neutrophils. And the platelets are low as well at 94, so the platelet reference range should be between 150 and 400. The other thing that we see is that the MCV stands for the mean cell volume. And that, that's the size, the average size of the red cells. Now, this is your reference range here. This is how, how large they should be. These red cells are larger than they should be at 106 femtoliters. And that, that gives us a clue again as to what kind of um, anemia this is, what, what, what could be causing this. Um, typically, we see an increased MCV uh, in anemia due to myelodysplasia and various other things, but that's what this, this is a typical sort of story for myelodysplasia. This is just to remind you what neutrophils are supposed to look like. They're not supposed to look like that. Why is it myelodysplasia? Well, it's, it has the appearance of myelodysplasia. These red cells look abnormal, the neutrophils look abnormal, and everything is low. The bone marrow just isn't working properly. The white cells are low, neutrophils are low, platelets are low, hemoglobin is low. This, this is a case of myelodysplasia. Now, there are various other things that can cause all the cells to be reduced. We call that pancytopenia. Um, and in order to make the diagnosis, we don't usually have clear-cut blood film like this. Sometimes the blood film looks completely normal. We really don't know what's going on. And in those cases, we have to look at the bone marrow to find out. That's not what I'm going to be talking about today. But you could ask me questions. On so we stick to the red cells. So I said you can have too few red cells or you could have too many. And in this case, again, this is another real patient, a 58-year-old lady who presented with headaches. And she found that after a hot shower, she was intensely itchy. That's called aquagenic pruritus. Um, and she was also a bit red in the face. Her, her, her friends had noticed this and pointed it out to her. She goes to see her GP and she has a blood test. And in her case, um, things aren't low. They're, they're a wee bit too high. The, the hemoglobin is raised at 227. That's well above the reference range. And there's this thing called the hematocrit, which is too high. Now, unless, you, unless you're one of the patients with polycythemia, we've, I'm sure you haven't had anyone discuss the hematocrit with you, so I will explain that in a wee minute. We also notice that the white cells are a wee bit high, the neutrophils are a little bit higher than normal, and the, platelet, well, the platelets are normal in this case, so that's fine. But things are generally increased. Um, and I'm going to move this out of the way so I can see. That's right. So... So I've just, I've just moved the image of myself to the bottom corner so it's not in the way and I can actually read what my slides say. Um, so the hematocrit is basically the percentage of the blood that is made up by red cells. And it's represented here. This is, say you took a test tube of blood and you, you spun it in a centrifuge and you took it out. All the different components would separate out and you'd end up with red cells all down at the bottom of the tube, and then plasma, in which the cells are bathed, um, that ends up at the top of the tube, and there's this very thin layer in between called the buffy coat that contains the, the white cells and the platelets. And this is what it would normally look like. The red cells should make up about 45% of, of that. Now, in this case, you'd end up so with a hematocrit of 0.67 or 67%, the red cells would be all the way up to here. So you can imagine that's a much more concentrated, and thicker, stickier uh, blood. And it's no wonder that it, it, it gets a bit sludged up in the circulation. It can't flow as well as it should. And patients get a bit red in the face and they get headaches with this. So that's the, that's the hematocrit. You can get a high hematocrit or hemoglobin due to various things. 
it might be that your body is responding to low oxygen levels. You can see this in patients that, or people that live at high altitude. Um, you, um, you, that, in order to cope with the low oxygen levels, your bone marrow makes more red cells. Um, similarly, uh, if you've got problems with your lungs, if you've got something like COPD because you, you've been unfortunate or you've smoked too much or something like that, um, then you don't get enough oxygen into the system and your body responds by making more red cells. So you, what oxygen you have, you can carry it around uh, to the vital organs more easily. So if you've got low oxygen level for whatever reason, then your hemoglobin will often be increased. There's a hormone called erythropoietin, which your kidneys make in response to anemia or uh, low oxygen. And that tells your bone marrow to make more red cells. So if you're Erythropoietin is high, then your red cells will go up. And some people do that by injecting themselves with erythropoietin if, if they want to cheat on the Tour de France, for example. Or um, there are some strange tumors, say the kidney or the liver, that, that, that produce erythropoietin and cause an increase in red cells. Now, that's all pretty rare. What's commoner is that uh, maybe just a wee bit dehydrated when they took the blood. You can as you can imagine, that results in less fluid, less plasma. So, the, so if we say we remove the top bit of the plasma there, the red cells would be the same uh, in total, but the percentage of, to of the total would be increased. So if you're dehydrated, you get slightly more concentrated red cells, slightly more concentrated blood rather, and uh, that will increase your hematocrit. So all you have to do Hmm. Let's drink a wee bit more. That's all well and good, but what most of the haematology patients uh, will be dealing with is uh, some sort of problem with the bone marrow. It might be that your, your bone marrow just makes too many red cells. And that's a condition called polycythemia rubrovira. That's the old fashioned name for it. Um, we also call it polycythemia vera or primary polycythemia. How can we tell if that's what's going on? Well, it used to be quite difficult. We used to have to do x-rays of the chest and ultrasounds of the, of the spleen and red cell mass with, uh, we take your red cells and label them with uh, a small amount of ra um, radioactivity and inject it back. And then, oh, it was also, it was very difficult. But now we've got a simple blood test and it's positive, it comes back positive in 95% of cases. We can look for a thing called the JAK2 mutation. It's a molecular test, and I will mention it later. Oh, oh yeah, we're all right. What's the problem with a high hematocrit? If you've got too many red cells, what is the problem? Here's another real story. And this is, this is one of my patients. This, this happened in 2013. He, he might be watching, I don't know. Um, I won't mention his name, um, but this this actually appeared in the in the newspapers, so it's not um, not really breaching confidentiality. It's something that was out there in the public domain already. Back in two thousand and thirteen, it was his thirty third birthday, and he'd been uh, been at work and then he'd been at the gym uh, with the, the rest of the lads, and he was just leaving the gym and he remembers feeling sweaty and he got a bit dizzy and then he just collapsed blacked out. He could hear everyone around him, but he couldn't see anything, and then he couldn't remember anything at all after that. Until he woke up in intensive care, surrounded by machines, he was paralysed, he couldn't speak. It must have been absolutely terrifying. He had no idea what had happened to him, and he, he could see the reaction of, of all his friends and family, and they, they were obviously well absolutely terrifying and completely devastating. He didn't know what happened at the time, but he could read it on their faces. And what had happened is that he'd had a stroke because his red cells and white cells and everything, platelets, they were all sky high. And we were trying to work out why this had happened. His hemoglobin was very high at 192. Hematocrit was not as high as that last lady's hematocrit, but it's still above normal at 0.57. The white cells were really high, much higher than the last patient. There's a few other odd immature 
uh, or less mature white cells in the circulation. And the platelet count was massive. So if you remember, platelets should be between 150 and 400. This guy's platelets were over 1,500. So his blood was really thick and sludgy. And that was the, that's what caused the stroke. Well, we were trying to work out why this had happened. Um, we wondered if he had polycythemia. We wondered about chronic myeloid leukemia because the white cells were high. We wondered whether, maybe he'd been at the gym, we wondered whether he maybe took erythropoietin or testosterone because that could have driven things. But when we asked all these questions, but we didn't ask him for too long because he needed something doing. We decided that we needed to reduce the number of platelets as a, as a matter of emergency. So we did that mechanically. We used one of these machines. Again, some of you might have seen one of these. It's a leukophoresis machine. We use it to siphon off stem cells or platelets or white cells or whatever we're trying to remove. We can do it with this machine and we can replace um, we can replace what we've taken out with just some plasma. So if basically we took, we took uh, the patient's blood. We, this machine's got a centrifuge, so we spin the, the blood down in the, in the middle of the machine, and then you siphon off the component that you need to, to remove. And so we removed a whole lot of his platelets. The blood continues around in this circuitry, and and then we send it back, minus the platelets, into the other arm, along with some plasma to dilute things down. So that, that worked quite nicely. And that brought his platelet count down. You see it was super high, over 1,500 when he came in. And it was down within a few hours and right down to about 500, which is close to normal, uh, the following day. We also thought it'd be a good idea to, you know, the platelets that are there, we, we don't really want them to be all sticking together and we don't want the blood to clot. So we were give, he was given aspirin to prevent um, platelets um, sticking together. He was given clexane to, to uh, thin the blood by um, inhibiting the clotting proteins. So that was done all at the same time there. And then after a couple of days, we, we'd, we did a bone marrow to see what was going on, and we did a JAK2 test, and it came back positive. So we knew what was going on. Didn't really like the way his platelets were going back up again. So we started him on a drug called hydroxyurea, which um, reduced the platelet count and came down quite nicely. And it got better. And this, that was 2013. Now, it took him a long time with the help of the team in Burwood to get back on his feet, but he managed. And I see him very, very rarely these days, um, just to adjust the dose of hydroxyurea. And occasionally we take some blood off him to get his, his hematocrit down to a normal level. So he's back at work, he's driving again. He's a pleasure to see in clinic. Um, and it's mainly, mainly thanks to the brain injury rehab team. They did a fantastic job. Um, I have to do very little is a blood normal now that we know what's wrong. That's why we treat polycythemia. It's not just to improve the numbers. We try to prevent that sort of thing. He was very unlucky to present with a complication, polycythemia. Most people are like the first patient. We work out what's wrong with them and we treat them so that that sort of thing doesn't happen. What about the platelets? They're the tiny wee cells uh, that you need to form clots and stop, stop your bleeding. If you don't have enough of those, you're at risk of bleeding. If you've got too many, you're at risk of clotting. So I've got another case for you this time. 57-year-old lady, and she presented with uh, this sort of a rash. But she felt quite well, and her gums were bleeding after she brushed her teeth. So that, that didn't seem normal for her. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't right. So the GP did a blood test, and... Everything was pretty normal except for the platelets. The platelets are right down in single figures, four. Remember, the normal range for platelets is 150 to 400. So four is not nearly enough. This is a close-up of her skin. This is the tichial rash. So that's, that represents um, tiny little bleeds uh, under the skin. Why does she have low platelets? Well, one, could it be because the bone marrow is just not making enough stuff? Well, usually if that's the case and the bone marrow is failing, 
it's because of something like myelodysplasia or leukemia. And it's not just the platelets that are affected, it's everything. Or could it be that the platelets are being destroyed in the circulation? Um, there's a thing called ITP, immune mediated thrombocytopenia purpura. So that's why we call it ITP, it's much easier to say. So that seemed more likely. Uh, the clues here that were that the other blood results were normal and the patient was otherwise well. So much more consistent with the diagnosis of ITP. And this is a condition where patients produce antibodies against their own cells. And the antibodies stick to the platelets and then they get destroyed, usually in the spleen. Now, how do we know this is the case? Well, this is a good story. This, is, this represents the fine line between genius and stupid, possibly erring towards genius, uh, more than stupid in this case. This chap is a guy called uh, William Harrington. I think that's right. Yeah, William J. Harrington. And he worked out how ITP worked. And he did, a, he did an experiment. And after the experiment, he, he published in 1951, he established the, the cause of ITP. He said there was, a, there was a substance in the blood of patients with thrombocytopenic purpura. And that was something that, that, that caused the low platelets. And he demonstrated this by injecting it into himself. So he injected the pint of an ITP patient's blood into himself. He made sure that the, the blood groups were compatible, because he wasn't, he wasn't stupid. Um, and then almost immediately, his platelet count dropped, and he got all those uh, purpuric tichial uh, marks on his skin. He got a rash like that patient. And then he had a seizure, and he had to be admitted to his own hospital. Fortunately, he got better, and he managed to persuade a few other people to have the, the same thing done, and he, he charted their platelet count, and all the platelets went right down, and then after a couple of weeks, they came back up again. So he, he had pretty good evidence that there was something in the patient's blood that caused this. And then uh, 40 years later, he was repairing an electric generator outside during a thunderstorm, and he died. So that was, that was less genius, but um, that's what happened to him. But he... He, uh, it was quite remarkable in, in establishing the cause of ITP. What else can happen with your platelets? Well, you could have too many of them. Um, usually when the platelet count is high, it's a, it's a reaction to something like bleeding or iron deficiency or infection. So you quite often see the platelets going up as, as a cause, as a result of that. But it could be that, that the bone marrow just makes too many of its own record, and that's a condition called essential thrombocythemia. You can get the same sort of complications as you get in polycythemia. And you see the same mutation in about two thirds of cases, this JAK2 uh, mutation. Now, two thirds of the rest of the cases can be accounted for with these other mutations. So these are blood tests that I mentioned very briefly at the end. We treat essential thrombocythemia for exactly the same reason we treat PRV. We don't want people to have heart attacks or strokes. Let's say a wee bit about white cells. So neutrophils, we're always interested in neutrophils. After we've given you chemotherapy, and neutrophils are really low in your risk of infection. And this cell here, the neutrophil, is really important for fighting off bacterial and fungal infections. Um, so that's why we worry about these things and we make sure that you get yourself in the hospital immediately if your neutrophils are low and you get a fever. Reason these counts can be low. It might be because of disease, where the bone marrow is full of faulty stuff like leukemia or fibrosis or myelodysplasia, or it might be because of something that we've done. It's often because we gave you chemotherapy and the neutrophil count is low. Um, lymphocytes, uh, they're important for fighting infection as well. Um, B cells, which eventually become plasma cells, they make antibodies to fight off infections. T cells are really important fighting viruses and uh, defending the body against cancer. So they're an important part of your immune system. Why might those levels be low? Usually it's after we've given you chemotherapy or a transplant. Sometimes they can get low with certain viruses. HIV will drop the lymphocyte count, but usually we don't have to worry about that um, with, with our hematology patients, although we sometimes do have to check. Um, and the lymphocytes will obviously be high in things like uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, and infections. Leukemic blasts, we really aren't supposed to see in the bloodstream at all. That, that's never a good thing. This is a picture of a blast with 
It's a myoblast, and I can tell it's a myoblast because it's got these rods in it. These are called hour rods. So this is the sort of blast that you would see in acute myeloid leukemia. They're not supposed to be in the bloodstream at all. And I think this might be one of the last cases. This is a 60-year-old PT um, that I know very well. And she presented, she was just non-specifically unwell and no covered in bruises. And she was very pale. And she was breathless. Um, she was symptomatic of anemia, but in spite of this, she managed to win the last game of squash that she played just the day before she attended hospital for her blood test. Her entire family were medical, they're a mixture of uh, pediatricians, GPs, surgeons, dentists, physiotherapists. It must have been absolutely awful for the team that admitted her and had to deal with, uh, with that. Um, but anyway, when she came in, her hemoglobin was very low, 76. That's about half what it should have been. White cells were low, neutrophils were very low, and the platelets were also low, single figures. No wonder she was getting all this bruising and bleeding. No wonder she was uh, breathless on exertion with that hemoglobin levels. And this is what her blood looked like under the microscope. These are blasts. You can see those rods again. These are, again, our rods, but a lot more than you'd normally see. And these particular blasts are characteristic of a type of leukemia called acute polymyelosis of leukemia. That leukemia used to be fatal very quickly because it caused major problems with blood clotting and patients would run into terrible problems with bleeding. Fortunately, now it's actually one of the best types of leukemia to have if you, if you have to have one because it responds very well to um, a vitamin, um, uh, all transretinoic acid. And uh, that's what she received along with some chemotherapy. That was in 2001. Now 80, she's going strong, and she's my auntie Eileen. And uh, she's my, ah, she's probably my favorite. Oh, I don't have favorites, but she's my auntie. She's brilliant. And now she just has to worry about all the other things that happen to you when you're 80 years old. But she's been cured of her leukemia. So I'm, I'm, it's nice to have happy endings sometimes. Now, I could say more about CBC and blood films, but that could take forever. So um, I'll do some other blood tests quick. And myeloma, multiple myeloma, myeloma, plasma cell myeloma, all the same thing. Just we decided to call them different things. Myeloma, it's all the same condition. Um, there are a few blood tests that are important for myeloma, so it's really important that, that we mention these. Now, myeloma, in myeloma, the cell that goes wrong is the plasma cell. That's the cell that becomes cancerous. And the plasma cell is uh, the cell in your, uh, in your immune system that makes antibodies. So normal plasma cells make antibodies to fight infections. If one of those plasma cells goes wrong and becomes cancerous and makes more, just multiplies and makes loads and loads of itself, so it's a, a clone of nasty, uh, faulty plasma cells, each of those cells makes an identical antibody. And that's a clonal antibody called a paraprotein you can detect that in the blood, and that's often the way we make a diagnosis of myeloma. So another real story, quite a familiar one. This is another patient of mine, a um, 44-year-old man, painter and decorator. And he, he presented, it was quite a long history of rib pain and a bit of back pain. He actually hurt himself lifting a bit of concrete, so he thought it was a work-related injury. But the pain didn't really settle down the way you'd expect it to. He had numerous visits to his GP and the physio to try and sort out his back. And then he, he hurt his ribs just by coughing. And that, that didn't seem right for a 44-year-old either. There was a delay in investigating, probably because this was thought to be a work-related injury. We eventually ended up going to a different GP. Um, and by that time, it was quite obvious that there was something far wrong very pale, he was in quite a bit of pain in his back and his ribs, and his haemoglobin was about half normal. So that, that's just not right. And we did some other blood tests and we found that his creatinine level was high. Now that creatinine is a, a waste product that you, if 
kidneys get rid of. So if your kidneys aren't working properly, then the creatinine level in the blood will go up. So this represented a problem with his kidneys. His blood calcium level was a little bit higher than normal as well. I haven't given you the reference range, but that's just a wee bit higher than it should be. And that's because of the, he had some damage to his bones and that's the reason the calcium level was high. Did some x-rays and that showed that he had, he actually had some fractures affecting the spine and, and the ribs. And then all of this taken together made the GP very suspicious that this might be myeloma. So they did immunoglobulin levels and they found that his IgA, which is a subtype of immunoglobulin, was much higher than it should be. And that's because there was a faulty plasma cell clone and each cell in that clone was making an identical IgA protein. So that is about 20 times higher than it should be. This is actually the way his blood film looked when he came in. And if if you remember from before, all the, all, this, all the red cells were nicely spaced out, but in this, they're all stacked up like coins. And that's because of the abnormal protein. The abnormal protein, usually, um, usually the red cells repel each other because they've got the same charge, so they're nicely spaced out. If you've got too much of this uh, IgA protein like he, he did, the protein sticks to the red cells, it neutralizes the charge, and all the red cells can then stick together. So this appearance is called RULO. And when we say in a blood film report that we've seen RULO, the, the, the GP really worries about myeloma because it's, that's one of the things that we see in myeloma. This is a plasma cell. This is one of his myeloma cells that was actually in the circulation. We looked at his bone marrow and we found loads of these myeloma cells and that's how we make the diagnosis of myeloma. This is a normal marrow here, and really all you need to know is that there's all sorts of different cells in there, lots of different um, cell types at different um, states of maturity. Whereas in this marrow, there's just loads and loads of the wrong cell. There's just too many plasma cells in there. So this made the diagnosis. Serum protein electrophoresis. Again, most of you probably haven't been, we haven't talked about that to you at all, and you don't need to know about it, but myeloma patients do need to know about this, or they, I expect they'd be interested. This is how we detect the abnormal protein in, in the bloodstream. So we, we take blood and we take serum from the blood. So that's just the, it's like the plasma without the clotting proteins. No cells in there, so just the proteins. And we drop it onto uh, an electrophoretic strip and we pass a current across that strip. And all the different proteins that should be in your blood migrate to different points in the strip. It's like chromatography. So they, all, they should all end up in different places. And this is what it should look like normally. Albumin all sits here. You're supposed to have lots of albumin. And then the bit where your immunoglobulins sit, you should have a sort of diffuse smear there, but not too much. And that's normal. If you've got an infection and you're making lots and lots of antibodies in response to infection, you'll still get a diffuse smear, but it will be a bit darker because there's more protein. And if you've got myeloma, instead of getting a, a diffuse smear of, uh, of, of different antibodies in different places, you get this band where all of that paraprotein ends up in the same spot. So this is serum protein electrophoresis, and we can quantify the uh, paraprotein there. And this is one of the blood tests that we do with myeloma to make the diagnosis and also to monitor response to treatment because that level will come down as we give um, patient treatment. And when it disappears, we're pretty happy, very happy. So this patient was treated with chemotherapy, um, cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, same stuff that we usually use first, first line. Um, again, I expect there'll be some people watching that have had that. And then because he was young and fit, we consolidated his treatment with a very big dose of melphalan and we gave him his cells back. So that's an autologous stem cell transplant. So that's our standard treatment for uh, myeloma. He actually achieved a complete response. His, his protein, his abnormal protein disappeared. We couldn't detect it anymore. How do I know he had a complete response? Well, yes, we, his immunoglobulin levels went back to normal. No detectable paraprotein. His CBC went back to normal. So he didn't have anemia anymore. His other counts went back to normal. 
his kidneys got better, his calcium level went back to normal. If he'd been in a clinical trial, they would have made us do a bone marrow just to prove that things are better. But to be honest, I was quite happy with these blood tests and he didn't want a bone marrow. Nobody wants a bone marrow if they don't. So we didn't do it. Okay. Have I got much to know? Much time for biochemistry tests, but very quickly. Urea and electrolytes, that's, um, that gives us an idea how well the kidneys are functioning. Because we look at the waste products um, and hopefully we see things like creatinine aren't too high, but if your kidneys aren't working, the creatinine level goes up. We see that in things like myeloma. And if we've given you drugs that can affect the kidneys, things like that. Hyperkalemia means a high potassium level, and we see that in kidney problems as well. We see a thing called pseudo hyperkalemia uh, in patients that have very high platelet or white counts. And that's the biochemists say, oh, you've got a problem. Your patient's got a potassium level that's sky high. You say, well, no, that can't be right because they're fine. Um, they, they, they wouldn't be fine if it was really that high. Um, and the reason we get those results in patients with very high white cell and platelet counts is that um, the, there's a lot of potassium within the cells. And if the sample sits doing nothing before it's processed, it sits for too long, the potassium leaks out into, uh, into the, the, the plasma and we get these disturbingly high levels, which aren't real. It's an in vitro thing. I'm not even gonna talk about that, but I would say hyponatremia means a low sodium level. We'll draw a veil over that one. More abnormal biochemistry, hypercalcemia, so that's a high calcium level. We see that in myeloma. And if we see that in myeloma, we know that the myeloma is causing trouble, usually because there's damage to bones and calcium from the bones is getting into the bloodstream. Sometimes we see a similar problem in lymphoma, but it's, it's not really so common. The mechanism is not really all that clear. We might look at the liver function tests. Um, bilirubin level is increased if your red cells are destroyed because they release hemoglobin and that gets broken down to bilirubin. Um, so if that's the case, then the bilirubin level goes up and the patient can be a little bit jaundiced, but the other liver enzymes are normal. If the liver enzymes are abnormal, that suggests that there is a problem with the, the liver, and that could either be because of inflammation of the liver, which we sometimes see in things like graft versus host disease, or because we've given drugs that are toxic to the liver, or it might be that we there's blockage of a bile duct, and we sometimes see that in things like um, lymphoma, where there might be something pressing on the bile duct. Um, but these are less, um, these are things that we less commonly look at in, in hematology patients, but I've, I've mentioned it. So I'm, I imagine that you're running out of steam, just like I am. I mentioned some molecular tests very quickly. I did say the JAK2 mutation is something that we see in a high number of cases of what's called myeloproliferative disorders. So 95% of cases of polycythemia and about two thirds of cases of myelofibrosis and essential thrombocythemia. You can do other fancy tests. Some cases of polycythemia, uh, we'll find this other thing called the exon 12 mutation. Calreticulin mutation is something that we find in about two thirds of the patients with essential thrombocythemia and myelofibrosis that were negative for the JAK2 mutation. And then this thing called C-MIPL is um, present in some cases of myelofibrosis and very few cases of essential thrombocythemia. But these are all tests that we can do. Uh, the, the test, it's a polymerase chain reaction. I'm not gonna talk about how that's done, but that's, that's how we check for these. What do they all have, the, have in common? These are all mutations that affect the same signaling pathway in cells and basically switch. If there's an abnormal cell uh, with this mutation, it's permanently switched on and it's telling itself to make more of itself. So they end up with too many red cells or platelets or whatever cell is affected. Similar thing happens in chronic myeloid leukemia. And there's another cell signaling uh, molecule called PCR ABLE, which isn't a normal molecule. It's something that happens if um, 
some genetic material is swapped between chromosomes 9 and 22, and that makes a thing called the Philadelphia chromosome, which is an abnormal chromosome 22. And that sticks a couple of um, genes together, BCR, ABLE, uh, sorry, BCR and ABLE. ABLE is the thing that uh, signals, and it just signals far too much. So you've got these abnormal white cells that are permanently switched on, and they just make too many white cells. Can we exploit this? Well, we can do that blood test to make the diagnosis. We can detect the BCR able mutation by PCR, and we can exploit it therapeutically because there's a drug called imatinib, which is designed to specifically inhibit that mutated um, protein, the BCR able, and it it prevents signaling of, of BCR able um, to the downstream proteins that uh, continue to relay the signal to the cell to make more of itself. So uh, I think that's probably about enough of that. I'm sure everyone's running out of steam. Can we exploit this? Yes, we can. We can also use BCR able um, blood tests to monitor the response to treatment. We give and patients that drug imatinib, then the number of abnormal cells reduces. And the first thing that happens is that the, the CBC goes back to normal. And then if we keep giving treatment with imatinib, that fancy drug, then the level of leukemic cells drops even further. And the only way we can detect it is by using this molecular test to, to, to detect tiny, tiny percentages of disease. We can use those results to guide management and say, can we, can we stop this treatment? We might be able to stop the treatment after a few years uh, when we've had a, a good year or two of, of um, negative results. So it's, it's a very useful test that we can use to, to guide our management. I think that's probably about enough. How are we doing time-wise? Sean, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful um, presentation and it was really, um, you know, it was great to have all those slides as well as the family stories. Thank you to Auntie Eileen and, <laughs> and to Mr. Harrington for having such an interesting life. But Sean, I know there'll be many disappointed if we don't get to finish with a song, if you were willing to just share one with us. We'd love to do that. We're a little over time, but I'm sure we've got enough for just one, one more song. How do you feel about that? I feel fine about that. I hope other people have an appetite for it. That would be fantastic. We'd Perhaps. love that. If we could finish with a song, that would be great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, this is the Anemia song. I thought long and hard about the title. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a song that I think the medical students to, to highlight the, the, the three main causes of anemia. I usually play it on the piano. So if it goes wrong in the ukulele, I'm really sorry, but we'll, we'll do our best. So. Anemia, what does it mean to you? Red cell destruction or reduction in production with associated cytopenias? Or could it be that you've simply forgotten all of that blood posing out of your bottom? Anemia makes me feel blue. Listless, fatigued, and lethargic. You're breathless, just climbing the stair. Because <laughs> parts of your body need oxygen, and there's no way of taking it there. When you're low in hemoglobin, there's ways that this might come about. So make sure you're not bleeding, have strange ways of feeling. Then maybe give us a shout. Anemia, what does it mean to you? Red cell destruction or reduction in production with associated cytopenias? Or could it be that you've simply forgotten all of that blood hose and not of your bottom? 
Anemia makes me feel blue. My doctor, he says I have pale conjunctivity. He asked of the hue of my pee. And my menstrual cycle, he's taking the Michael. Oh, what is his point? I can't see. Stomatitis, glossitis, I don't feel quite right is the reason I fell on my face. Because I'm a vegan, I've lost all the feeling of where I'm positioned in space. Anemia, what does it mean to you? Red cell destruction or reduction in production with associated cytopenias. Or could it be that you've simply forgotten all of that blood hosing out of your bottom? Anemia makes me feel blue. So blue. Hmm. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Sean. It was lovely. And what a perfect way to end our session today. We really appreciate the time. We've got quite a few comments coming through there as you're a star and thank you so much. They've really enjoyed um, ending with that song. It's been fantastic. We really appreciate your time and that great information today. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care.